Hi, welcome again. It's another edition of West Michigan Weekend on this iHeart Radio station. And I am Phil Tower. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm very pleased to welcome back in uh, this segment of West Michigan Weekend. I'm very pleased to welcome back a friend of the program. We've had her on before. She is Jennifer Fitzpatrick. She is the nation's preeminent expert in caregiving, also a healthcare experience expert, professional speaker, and best selling author. Her book is actually about caregiving, cruising through caregiving, reducing the stress of caring for your loved one. And you've probably seen her. If that name sounds familiar on CBS TV or NBC or Fox News or ABC. And she is on our live line for the segment of West Michigan Weekend. Jennifer, it's great to have you back. Oh, thanks for having me back, Phil. Well, happy uh, holidays. And we just wrapped up the month of November, which was technically National Caregiving Month. But as I told you just a few moments ago, isn't every month, Jennifer, National Caregiving Month? I mean, this is becoming one of the most important things that happens to anybody. I, and I don't want to say things. That's a terrible word. Occupations. Help me with a better word for this. Well, it's probably one of those uh, situations that happens to most of us at one point or another in our lives, becoming a family caregiver or having to face the issue of helping somebody you care about make sure that they have the care that they need. Yeah, that's a great point. And caregiving does not typically end up being something you're planning for. I I guess if you're married, it's expected that your husband gets sick, you'll care for him as his wife or your wife gets sick as the husband, you will care for your wife at least as long as you can. And this is something that is happening in so many homes as we all get older, Jennifer, I hate to mention the obvious, but I mean, this can be something that if you don't manage it well, that's why you wrote the book, Cruising Through Caregiving, Reducing the, uh, the Stress of Caring for Your Loved One. You wrote that book because a lot of people really don't know how to do this right. Yeah, well, most of us, even those of us who actually do work in healthcare, uh, we have a little bit of an idea, but when it's your own family, it becomes a whole different ball game. But never mind, like somebody like you, you're in radio or you're an accountant or you work at Target or what have you. You, you probably have no idea what the heck you're doing. So the cruising through caregiving, I wrote it really just to let people know there's not one way to be a good caregiver. There's a lot of people think, well, in order to be a good caregiver, I have to move my mom into my home. Or in order to be a good caregiver, my husband who has dementia, well, he can never leave our home. There, We should never, he, it never is it a possibility that we, we should move him. Um, but there's a lot of ways to be a very good caregiver while maintaining your sanity. Yeah, and that's the most important thing. Let's talk about that in terms of you start the process. And caregiving, really, Jennifer, just t- to set the tables for our listeners, caregiving can look like a lot of different things. It can look like a couple of hours a week, maybe three or four hours a week, caring for a, a an elderly parent who lives in another home, maybe not so far away. I have a friend who lives in Milwaukee who drives to care for his dad who lives in Buffalo. And, you know, he does that a couple of times a month. His dad is fairly independent, but he needs, you know, he needs that regular touch base. And then you can have some caregiving that is literally around the clock in the same home in which you live, right? Exactly. And the other one, Phil, that I'll mention is sometimes people are functioning as it, it, like secondary caregivers from even across the world. I, I have a, a colleague who's actually mom just passed away. Um, her mom lives in Germany. Uh, she lives in Maryland. And, you know, she was helping out by providing money toward her care, toward mom's care. She was checking in with mom periodically. She wasn't able to do the hands-on stuff that other people in the family could do. But there were other ways that she could be supportive. So I think it's important for everybody especially like this holiday season for everybody to remember, even if you don't live right next to that person um, or like your friend that drives to, to, I think you said Buffalo, uh, it's, you can contribute. There are ways you can contribute. Can you contribute financially? Can you contribute by FaceTiming or Skyping or even just making Mm -hmm. a phone call every so often to check on the person that's doing most of the work or, to, to send cards to your loved one. There are ways that people can contribute even if they're far away. Yeah, I'm so glad you said that. Jennifer Fitzpatrick is with us. She's an expert on caregiving and 
the whole health care experience. Also a professional speaker. Her book is Cruising Through Caregiving, Reducing the Stress of Caring for Your Loved One. In fact, Jennifer's got a great website with all kinds of resources for you generationshealth.com and it's generations with a j j e n e r a t i o n s health.com and i i want to ask you something i don't know we talked about this book probably a couple of years ago when it first came out i don't know if i ever ask you this are there some people who just are not good at caregiving or say they're not good at caregiving and let's just face it jennifer there's some people who are just they're they're loners. They like to be alone. They don't like caring for people. They may, maybe not selfish. Maybe there's nervousness or concern yeah. of doing something wrong. Can that be corrected if somebody's suddenly, a person like that, is suddenly thrust into a caregiving role? Well, they're not, that person is probably not always going to be the best primary caregiver. So maybe we don't want them to be helping out in the bathroom or right. So, so I, I think that's what, te- what people tend to think about when they think of caregiving. Oh gosh, helping out in the bathroom. I remember when my husband's dad was sick, he, he would fall into the category that you just described, you know, maybe it doesn't come as naturally to him. And he said, you know, I'll, I'll help with other things. I'll cook. I'll, if I need to give him his medicine, I'll, hang out with him, but I really don't want to help him with personal care. Mm. So I think it's really important for everybody who's participating to just set their boundaries. Like what, I'll give you another example. My dad, when we were all taking care of my grandma, um, finally hit a point. We were all taking turns sleeping at her place. My dad finally set a boundary and said, I can't sleep over there anymore. I don't get a good night's sleep. Um, I really need to be able to, um, sleep in my own place, but I'll still take her to the doctor. I'll still bring her meals. So I think that it's important for all of us to just be really honest with everybody else who's participating. What can we do and what can't we do? That's such, you know what, that's such a great point. Is it safe to say more than ever, there are more caregiving resources available than at any point in the, in the history really, of caregiving? There really are. But you know, the thing is, Phil, I think a lot of times people just don't even realize it until they start looking. And so the, the big ones that I will tell everybody to look for is when, if you're a caregiver, if you're just starting out, the best place to start is with your local area agency on aging. And you can find that by just plugging in your zip code or your town into N as a Nancy, 4A.org, N4A.org, an organization in your local community that is dedicated to older adults. And so they're not going to be able to solve all your problems, but they're a great place to start. Yeah, um, the other two that I really like, if you're dealing with dementia, which is a huge issue for a lot of older adults and families, is ALZ.org for the Alzheimer's Association. But also, I ha- happen to be on the advisory board for Seth Rogen and Laura Miller Rogen's nonprofit called uh, Hilarity for Charity. And their website is We Are HFC. Um, if you just Google Seth Rogen and dementia, you'll, if you don't remember that website, but mm. here's the thing that they do. They provide grant money for family caregivers who want to bring respite home care into the home. Um, and I find it to be a wonderful solution for people in the middle, like middle class, people who aren't super wealthy, but don't really, they can't qualify for Medicaid. I encourage everybody to apply if you are taking care of a loved one with dementia and you'd like a little help in the home, especially since it's the holiday season, if you're looking to make a donation and you're not caregiving and you want, I mean, this is a really great charity that actually puts professional help in the home of people who have dementia. That's a great point. Jennifer Fitzpatrick is with us, founder of Generations Health Education and also author of the great book, Cruising Through Caregiving. You can find that wherever books are sold and also at Generations Health. That's Generations with a J. So what about, Jennifer, the caregiver? You're married to a caregiver. She's caring for an older parent or an older aunt or uncle how can a husband or wife support their caregiver in the family or, or maybe another adult living in the home? So again, I think it's just about having a conversation about what the, what's that spouse willing to do. Maybe that spouse, again, like a lot of times the spouses are kind of funny about, I don't want to help in the bathroom. That's a big one that you hear. Yeah. Um, what are they willing to do? What are they willing to do to help? Like maybe run errands, maybe, 
hang out with that person while the wife or the spouse goes and gets her hair cut or something like that. But I think the other piece of it is that that spouse, one of the most important things that that spouse can do is ensure that the wife or whoever it is, that they don't get burned out and insist that they take breaks and remind them it's not just their job. And so to me, like, I think what a good spouse or partner does is, you know, you you have a caregiving situation. If it's short term, a month, three months, fine. When you get into six months, a year, two years, five years, Mm -hmm. you can't go on indefinitely without some kind of ongoing help from maybe a home care agency, an adult daycare center. Maybe it's even time for assisted living. So I think that that spouse has to be looking out to make sure the, the caregiving does not become that person's entire existence. Because here's the thing, when, when caregiving becomes your whole existence, your, your quality of life is lousy. Your spouse's quality of life is lousy. And guess what? The person you're caring for, their quality of life is lousy because they're not getting the best of you. So you do this guilt trip to yourself. Oh, I've got to do everything. Well, your loved one's really not getting a great deal to be completely frank. Yeah. They're, they're, they're getting, they're not getting the best of you. So you've got to take some breaks. And I think a good spouse or partner pushes for that. That's what you describe as getting lost in caregiving, where it literally right. becomes every dimension of your life. You get up, you care, give, you care, give all day long. You, you know, maybe have two minutes to eat something real fast and then go back to caregiving. You go to bed, you wake up in the middle of the night for caregiving. It literally can consume almost every moment of your life. If you're and not careful. I call that martyr syndrome. That's what I call it. Um, why? Tell us why. <laughs> because I think people sometimes, if they don't have other things going on in their life, sometimes they're like, all right, well, I have to be the only one to do this. Or if they think they're superhuman, they have kids, they have a job. It, it, I think that martyr syndrome oftentimes happens to people who are a bit of control freaks. <laughs> yeah. So no one that could do it as well as I can do it. So it can be hard to push somebody out of that. And if you see somebody in that situation, try to get them to talk to a therapist or try to get them to go to a caregiver support group. And the what I said earlier, n4a.org or going to your Alzheimer's Association, you can find tons of both in-person and virtual support groups. And I think that what's really important about that is when you have those support groups, you're hearing from people who have been there, done that, that are peers they're going to tell you, hey, I thought that I had to keep my mom at home for 10 years. You know what? It wasn't good for her. It wasn't good for me. I thought mm-hmm. I had to do everything. When I started letting neighbors and friends and people from our faith community participate, things got better for us. So professionals like me can say all the things in the world. <laughs> but when you hear it from somebody who's actually in the trenches, it really means a lot. The support groups are huge. I'm so glad you said that. Uh, Jennifer Fitzpatrick with us. Her book is Cruising Through Caregiving. Jennifer, I've got less than a minute left. You have a new book coming out in February. Just take a, a quick moment to tell us about that. Sure. Uh, it's Reimagining Customer Service in Healthcare. It comes out February 28th, Post Hill Press. It's all about how health, mental health, and senior living professionals can improve the patient experience. So I'm speaking now to the professional caregivers, not the family caregivers. So Reimagining Customer Service in healthcare comes out on February 28th. I cannot think of a more needed book, especially at this time, as uh, there's such an avalanche of people needing care. Jennifer Fitzpatrick, always appreciate having you on the program. Jennifer, of course, the author of Cruising Through Caregiving, Reducing the Stress of Caring for Your Loved One, and also a healthcare experience expert, professional speaker, and best-selling author. So glad to have you. Happy holidays, and we look forward to having you back in February to talk about the new book. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks so much, Phil. Take care.